Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Connor, and I'm Representative Houlihan's Communications Director. I'd like to welcome you all to our telephone town hall featuring Congresswoman Karen Bass. Our topic today will be police reform, so please have your questions about that topic. Obviously, we have a lot of people on the call, so we are going to try and get to as many questions as we can. But if we are unable to get to a question today, we will respond to you within 48 hours um, with an answer to your question. Thank you so much for joining. If you do have questions throughout on your phone, you're going to press star three. Again, that is star three. At that moment, you'll be transferred to one of our staff members who will transcribe your question and put it in the queue. Thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Houlihan. Thank you, Connor, and thank you so much for Representative Ch to Representative Bass for joining us today. I also want to thank everyone who's on the line for joining our telephone town hall. I'm going to caveat this for those of us who are obviously in our area right now. Uh, there are very large thunderstorms coming through the area, so I'm sure hopeful that our connectivity will not be problematic, but apologies ahead of time if for some reason uh, we experience difficulties because of that. I'm very, very grateful for the chance to join you again uh, for what is now our 24th town hall since I took office as a freshman. And before I introduce Representative Bass, I wanted to take a few moments to say a few words. On May 25th of 2020, George Floyd lost his life at the hands of law enforcement. And since that day, we have heard a collective and unified cry across the country, a demand for police reform. Thousands of Americans of every race background, creed, sexuality, gender, and age have banded together and peacefully protested. And these protests aren't just happening in major cities. Across the country, from small towns to the suburbs, from the rural to the metropolitan, we've heard the same resounding refrain. The police culture in our country needs to change. And for those of us from our community, you know those uh, protests have happened peacefully. In Westchester, there's been a student-led march from uh, Wayne to Paoli. There have been a variety of protests uh, of various forms in Redding and in the Berks County area. And I'm really, really proud of our community for the way that they've conducted ourselves, the ways that we've conducted ourselves in peacefully protesting. There are moments when we are called upon to be leaders, all of us, to stand up for what is right for our community, for our commonwealth, and for our country. And this is clearly one of those moments. It is an undeniable fact that there is systemic racism in our country, and it has existed since our very founding. What we have borne witness to over the past month that continues today is a very unified call to action to address police brutality and the disparate treatment of people of color, particularly Black Americans. On June 10th, I chose to co-sponsor the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020, a bill sponsored and introduced by Congresswoman Ch Karen Bass, who is the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus. In my heart, I know that co-sponsoring co the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020 was and is the right thing to do to begin to answer this call for action. On June 25th, I voted to pass this legislation. And over the past few weeks, I've continued to speak with and learn from leaders of our community, Black leaders, law enforcement leaders, advocates, activists and experts to hear your concerns and to make sure that we are addressing them in Congress. I wanna continue those meetings and have these discussions with you, members of my community. It is so important for us all to understand what is at stake. And with that, I'd like very much to introduce our guest today, my colleague, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who's a really remarkable person. I want you to listen to a little bit of her background before I let her come online. Congresswoman Bass has been serving in Congress since 2010. She serves on the Judiciary Committee and alongside me on the Foreign Affairs Committee. In fact, she is my chair of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights in International Organizations. She is also the chair of the Congressional Caucus. Last month, she introduced the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act of 2020. Her work on this issue of police reform on both the Judiciary Committee and within the Congressional Black Caucus has been so crucial, and I am so privileged to be able to serve with her in Congress. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Congresswoman, Congresswoman Karen Bass for a few opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Representative Houlihan. And let me just say to your constituents in Pennsylvania's 6th District, you 
guys are very, very fortunate to have uh, Chrissy as your representative because although she has been in Congress a very short time, she distinguished herself and her leadership immediately. It has been a pleasure for me to work with her on the subcommittee and especially on this particular issue because it's not an easy issue and we are at a moment in our history that as someone who has worked on this issue for decades, I've not seen a moment like this before in my lifetime. And I think that all of us as a nation were just shook over the brutality of watching George Floyd be killed before our very eyes over eight minutes. And I think that that has led to us as a country to examine an issue that in the past has been so polarizing and I know within a certain sector of our country, it's still polarizing. But what is absolutely the case is 70% of the U.S. population believes that we have a problem with policing in America, and that is the first time that I have seen it. Without hesitation, Representative Houlihan jumped on board, has been instrumental with me in terms of expanding my ability to reach out to new members. You know, there's 435 of us and 235 are Democrats. And having conversations with the entire caucus, as you can imagine, is something that is quite challenging. So I just want to thank her for her leadership. Let me tell you that uh, many, many years ago, I started working on this issue. Actually, the year that George Floyd was born was the year I started working on this issue. And he was born in 1973. So that's a very, very long time. In African-American communities, this has been an issue the entire time, as, as Representative said, really back to the origins of our country, if not even before this has been an issue. But I think it took what happened and what we all saw to really shake not just the entire country. There have been protests in all 50 states and Frankly, it's a bit of an embarrassment that people around the world are protesting for human rights in the United States. Historically, we have been the beacon of human rights. All 54 nations in Africa went to the United Nations to raise this issue about policing in the United States and its impact on the African-American community. And so the thing about Congress is that it can take us 30 years or 30 days to act. And we acted within 30 days in coming up with the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And I just want to mention a couple of the features of the act and, and then engage in conversation. I know more features will come up. The first part of the bill really addresses accountability. One of the reasons why that officer uh, was looking straight in the camera as he killed Mr. Floyd with his hand in his pocket is because he knew that he could act with impunity. Fortunately, this time he was wrong. Uh, he was arrested, and he is going to be tried for murder. This is an unusual situation. Unless we pass the Justice and Policing Act, the odds of him being convicted are very, very small because of the way the law is written for police officers, where they have immunity right now, so you can't really sue them. In order to prosecute them, you have to talk about what they were thinking about, whether it was willful intent. Our bill reduces it to recklessness. You don't have to, we don't really get into what you were thinking. If you were reckless, it doesn't matter. Um, the idea that there should be a registry of officers that have a history of abuse, that particular officer did have a history of abuse. And maybe if the police chief had known about it, maybe he would have been fired or never hired. Banning chokeholds, banning no-knock warrants. Breonna Taylor was killed uh, because they knocked her door down and her and her boyfriend were asleep. They entered the house, they thought it was a home invasion, and she was killed. So there's several provisions like that that are in the bill around accountability. Another section of the bill talks about police accreditation and training. And I, this is a part of the bill that has widespread support from police departments. The Fraternal Order of Police, one of the national unions, even said that they've been working on national standards and accreditation for years, 
And if we're able to get this bill signed, it would help them tremendously. Police officers should be upgraded like any other profession. You go get your hair done, your hairstylist and your barber has to be accredited, but your police officer doesn't. And then finally, I want to mention a part of the bill that I'm very excited about, and that is the part that provides grants to communities to begin to re-envision policing, and that has become a very serious topic. What I have seen over the last 30 years specifically is I've watched resources be cut in the areas of health, social services, and economic development. And when we have divested from communities, we have invested in policing. And every police officer will tell you that they did not go into policing to be a marriage counselor, to resolve substance abuse or mental illness. So we need to invest back in our communities so that the police officers can actually do their jobs. We should not have replaced social workers with police officers. So I'm happy to engage in a conversation and uh, talk about ways that you in Pennsylvania's sixth district can participate in the effort, one, to get this bill signed, but also policing in your own area. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Representative Fulani. Well, that's a really wonderful uh, brief summary of the Justice and Policing Act, uh, Chairwoman. And I was hoping before we get into people's questions, if you would oblige me uh, just a couple of questions that have to do with what we can be doing. I know that sure. here in our community, we had a really lovely um, gathering in Westchester at, uh, at our city hall area where uh, Kyle Boyer, who's the head of the NAACP for uh, Westchester, you know, the Chester County area, gave us a really uh, inspiring call to action, which is effectively to do something. Um, and, you know, in Congress, of course, as you mentioned, we have, we have gone ahead and voted that bill forward. And I hope that we are able to find some daylight between the Senate bill and our bill so that we're able to find something that we can agree on. But if you could help me just help my community better understand and communities like mine across the country, how can we as individuals, as people, especially since right now we're largely sheltered in our homes and not really able to really be terribly good actors right now, how can we act or do something and how can we be better allies? Absolutely. Well, let me uh, say, first of all, you could certainly help your representative and I get this bill brought up for discussion and a vote in the Senate. And feel free to call the head of the Senate, Mitch McConnell. He is the one with the sole authority to get this bill uh, voted on within the Senate. You probably know the Senate had their own bill. And Senator Tim Scott, I have been in conversation with him. We need to get the Senate to act, and you can certainly make phone calls to uh, Mitch McConnell. But I also uh, have been telling people around the country, one of the best ways to be an ally is to actually look in your own communities. Because one of the phenomena about our country, I don't care what part of the country you are talking about, there really is disproportionate arrests and incarceration. And I think you can look at two places. What is happening in your schools? Uh, are your schools diverse? If there are African-American, Latino students in your schools, what is the suspension and expulsion rate? What is the arrest rate um, in, your, in your towns, in your cities, in terms of African-Americans and Latinos? Most part of the country, there is a black population. It doesn't matter how small it is. Even if it's 1%, I would not be surprised at all if the arrest and incarceration rate is not 10%. And raising questions on a local level, because this really is, it's a national issue that takes place in just about every city and town. I think if you even raise those issues, just the mere raising of the issues really will shine a spotlight on it and will help the people in your own communities. That's, that's very, very helpful. Um, and I think there definitely are a couple of really useful calls to action that are um, actionable uh, and relatively easy to, to get on board with and to find uh, time to do. So thank you for that. And one last question before we move to folks, but the question that others have provided, it comes from me, which is what do you see the next steps are for building a more equitable criminal justice system you know, what, can, what, what do you think we can do to make it so that what you're saying isn't the reality that we see across our nation, so that it is a more 
Karen Jeff uh, uh, system. Is there something that you are seeing that might uh, end up uh, helping that that issue? Absolutely, and thank you so much for the question. You know, I'm I'm so excited right now because um, 30, 30, 35 years ago when I was working on criminal justice issues, we were doing it from the point of view of we saw all these laws being passed and we knew it was going to lead to mass incarceration. And during those years, everybody was angry about crack cocaine and gang violence. And instead of addressing a health issue, which was addiction, and a social and an economic issue, which was uh, gang violence, we criminalized both issues. And so we're beginning to rethink about that now. And um, I, we are specifically working on undoing some of the, the laws that were done before, like mandatory minimums. Because if you look at incarceration in our country, the inequity is just screaming. If you basically are poor, in our country, you know, you can be incarcerated for months and months and months just because you can't make bail. And you can have uh, a little bit of crack or, or violate a law in one way, and then someone else who violates a much more serious crime does far less time. So we're beginning to look at those issues. My specific po focus, Chrissy, which you might not know about, is on women and children. Because in the past, when we've talked about criminal justice reform, we really have only been talking about men. Why do we incarcerate children? If a child has a problem, why don't we address the problem? And so even beginning to think and raise questions like this in your community, it's a, a, an important thing to do, and it begins to free up elected officials to feel they can raise these questions without being beat up for being soft on crime. And then one thing I always recommend that all of us can do while we're at home is on Netflix, there is a movie called, a documentary called 13, the number 13 for the 13th Amendment. Please watch that. It's about 90 minutes, and it really gives you a history of the criminal justice system as well as policing in America, dating it back to the uh, period of enslavement. But it's an excellent piece that gives you a historical background. Excellent. You've given me some homework to do, and I appreciate that. I will check that out. Um, and I think at this point in time, if it's all right with you, Chairwoman, I'd like to go ahead and start questions. Uh, Connor Absolutely. normally will interrupt here and, and tell us who we've got on the line. <laughs> and let's see if we've got somebody on the line. Perfect. Thank you, Congresswoman. And yes, we do have a number of people on the line. Just a reminder to everybody listening, please press star three if you would like to ask a question. For star three. All right, our first question comes from um, David in Berwyn. David, you should be on the line now. Yes, I'm on the line. Thank you. Ms. Houlihan, I have to thank you for having me. Hello? I'm here. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah well, I'm, I'm proud that you're my representative here in Berwyn here. And the reason I'm calling, I was listening to you uh, a few minutes ago when you were talking about your bill in the House of Representatives, and my question was, can you really get that Senate to do anything, really? Because they're a laughing stock. I, I, I think the leadership is bad. I'm not cr criticizing everyone, but we have a... a Representative um, of, uh, in the Senate is Mr. Um, Casey and Mr. Toomey. Now, I'm sure Mr. Casey would be glad to want this to be passed, but Toomey, he, I, I, I just don't understand them as, as a party. I just figure it's going to be very difficult for us. I hope not because it yeah. is a necessary bill to to pass because it's time, it's overdue. And I know you're trying your best to do it, and the reason I'm saying it is I was just calling in to thank you for our representation here because I've entered all your calls when you call me, but I just wonder if it's going to be a really uphill battle to get that Senate to do anything. Well, thank you, David, and I really appreciate your, your call, and I appreciate your uh, citizenry and your concern, and uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, the Senate Republicans have indeed put forward their own proposal. 
Uh, it's called the Justice Act, which is similar in some ways to the chairwoman's uh, bill, but it does have, uh, importantly, it lacks a lot of enforcement mechanisms, which I think is my concern and my guess is the concern of a lot of others of my colleagues as well. There are definitely some areas of agreement between the two bills, and, and for those of us of a certain age who grew up on Schoolhouse Rock and I'm just a bill, an ordinary bill, you know, we know the importance of uh, both the Congress and the House and the Senate uh, agreeing, uh, coming together and finding common ground, and then, of course, uh, voting on it and then sending it to the president's desk for signature. Uh, so some of the agreements are the importance of improved training, which the chairwoman mentioned a little bit about, and prohibiting certain tactics, which she also talked a bit about. But there is, as you mentioned, David, I believe a lot of daylight between the two concepts and the two proposals and the two bills. And so I'd really love to hear from the chairwoman about what she sees, because she's definitely in, in, the, in the circle that would know about the potential for any action, further action on the part of the Senate. Well, you know, um, I, I am definitely uh, hopeful. Uh, in my conversations with the senator, uh, he seems as though he's willing to move further. Uh, the devil is always in the details. In the House, and it's important because even though it's in the Senate, the opinion of our Republican colleagues in the South is still very important. And I will tell you that um, when we went through hearings and votes in committee and votes on the floor, this might sound a little strange, but I was in encouraged by my Republican colleagues because they spoke about every issue under the sun except for the bill. <laughs> and many of them came up to me afterwards and expressed an interest in working on this. And so uh, we are preparing to move forward in those discussions. There are no formal negotiations right now, but I am always interested in willing in talking. Uh, Representative Houlihan pointed out the most important difference, and that is enforcement mechanisms. So, for example, when it comes to chokehold, some people want to argue over a difference between a chokehold that blocks your carotid artery and a chokehold that blocks your trachea where you breathe. To me, your neck is your neck. Anatomy is too close to distinguish between that. The other thing is, is that um, in Senator Scott's bill, for example, he said, he says that chokeholds are banned unless the officer is in fear of his life. Well, actually, that's one of the problems because every single time an officer kills someone, they always say they're in fear of their life. So we have to make it much, much stronger, which is why we say it's a barbaric practice. It needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, do, do we have another question, Connor? We do. David, thank you so much for your question. Our next question comes from Jill in Reading. Jill, you should be on the line. Hi, Congress and, and Chrissy Holohan. Thank you for letting me talk. Of course. I have, a, I have a question. Our next generation, we're teaching them that they can put hands on authority figures. I'm not saying all police officers or anything are bad, but how are we going to teach the next generation in schools, or homes, stuff like that? I remember watching what Chrissy said, that the um, Bill thing on TV and all that. I'm, I remember watching that as a kid, too, but now the next generation, I'm thinking, is how are we going to teach them in schools? Is teachers, the police officers, they are the ones that they're supposed to be obeying at all times. Yeah, and thank and thank you, Jill, and for that really insightful, you know, kind of comment. And I grew up, as you may or may not know, in a military family. You know, my dad and my grandfather served careers in the military. I served in the military. My brother and several of my cousins. Uh, and so I, in some ways, really empathize with the police uh, because I have always been. A, a protector and, a, and, a, and of service. And I know that the police see themselves that way and the vast, vast, vast majority of police are. So this legislation is uh, to make sure that we're finding and, and addressing the issues where they are not. And your, my experience as a white woman uh, with law, law enforcement, meaning police throughout my life is very positive, overwhelmingly positive. And I was absolutely raised in the same way that I was raised to be respectful of men and women who serve in the military to be respectful of our police uh, men and women as well. But I recognize that my experiences are 
through my eyes and through the body uh, of a white woman who I am. And so very impactfully over the years, I've recognized that, that those are not always the experiences that everyone has. Uh, I had that uh, real revelation in Philadelphia when I was uh, fortunate enough to teach uh, at Simon Gratz, where interestingly enough, Jill, in Gratz, that Gratz, every floor had policemen. Every door had metal detectors that kids were going through. And so they didn't have that same positive experience with law enforcement that I did growing up. Um, and so that they did sort of get, get raised into this kind of a fear. And I would really rather them have a positive experience, which is why I think it's appropriate in some ways to think about what, what uh, the chairwoman said, which is policemen don't want to be marriage counselors. They don't want to be uh, uh, mental health counselors. They don't want to be uh, social workers. Those are proper things that should have been in my school at Simon Gratz, and yet they weren't there. And so instead, there were policemen at the school, and our kids didn't have those positive experiences that they really ought to have had with those people who are their protectors and their, and their defenders. And so um, I'd love to hear from Representative Bass if she has any insight on this issue, too. Sure, absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the things that I'm so appreciative of what you just said, uh, Representative Houlihan, because one of the things that I have just been so excited is kind of a weird word, but uh, relieved by, that's a better word, relieved by what we're going through is that every other time in the past when there had been a killing, even if it was on video, the first thing that people would say is they were questioning what happened before the videotape. They said, well, that person must have done something that resulted in this. Maybe they didn't listen, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt like as an African-American who grew up terrified of police. So it's not just the talk doesn't just happen with boys. The talk happens with girls as well. And I certainly remember having that talk with my daughter that if a police officer stops you, the most important thing is to make sure you survive. Um, but that finally, in this time, people have said, well, you know what, maybe that wasn't my experience, but let me learn about yours. In the past, when, when African Americans said, this is our relationship with police, we basically weren't believed. And poll after poll would show that we weren't believed, that people would say, well, I know that's your experience. I never experienced it, so there must have been something wrong with you. And this is the first time people have opened. And so it, it creates a tremendous amount of, of relief to me. One of the things that uh, happens is, is that police, a lot of times, the bad officers, they view communities of color differently than they view white communities. For example, I represent a part of Los Angeles. Part of my district is predominantly white and very affluent. The other part of my district is known around the world. It's South Central Los Angeles. Many, many, many police officers tell me that when some officers come out of the academy and they're ready to graduate, they ask to go to South Central so they could knock heads. That's their viewpoint. They view it as, let me go to war. I want to go where the action is. I want to bust heads. Well, what kind of way is that to view a community? If they go to the West Side that's very affluent, you know they don't go in like that. So it's kind of like there's two perspectives. There's the guardian police officer, which is the type of police all of us should have. Then there's the warrior police officer. And we have got to get rid of that warrior mentality. And one of the things that we try to do in the bill is address police culture, because it's the culture within the department that needs to change. Just one other example. You saw, the whole world saw the police officer at the protest push the 75-year-old man down. He was a white man, and he was at the protest, and the police officers knocked him down. Well, they lied, and they said that he tripped, which is something else that the black community always says, is that the police officers will lie in the reports. So they knocked him down. The man just recently got out of the hospital because they fractured his skull, and one officer leaned down to help him. The other officer pulled him away. So in our bill, we, we make it a law that it is the duty to intervene. Those officers that participated in the killing of George Floyd, they wind up getting charged too. They should have intervened and stopped that man who had his knee on his neck. It's the culture of policing that has to change, and it's the way they view minority communities that has to change. 
And, and another thing that Karen, that I'd like to add to that is here in our community, I know that our, that we're having some really good and hard uh, conversations amongst each other. I've been able and fortunate enough to gather a variety of different um, groups together, whether they're DAs or sheriffs or representatives from the Fraternal Order of Police or our state police, uh, chiefs of chief of polices uh, of our counties, moms of uh, black children have been part of those conversations, activists of one form or another. And we've, uh, unfortunately, because of the time that we're in, uh, the other pandemic that we're experiencing, all of these have been virtual, you know, meetings for the most part. But we've had some really good productive conversations. And I think all of us, uh, you know, understand that People don't get into, for instance, the military if they don't want to protect and defend. They don't want to get into the police if they don't want to protect and serve, in my opinion. I think there certainly are exceptions to that, and I think, think Karen's right that culture matters. You know, uh, corporate culture matters, uh, police culture matters, uh, military culture matters. And so we need to kind of get at some of these root causes. But I, I can tell you that here in our community, there's been some really, really heartfelt conversations and really open hearts trying to find our community's way through all of this uh, very difficult conversation. I think we have um, another question, and thanks very much, Jill, for your uh, wonderful question. Uh, Connor, who do we have next? Yes, Jill, thank you for your question. Our next question comes from Peter in Reading. Peter, you should be on the line now. Yeah. Sorry, Peter, do we have you on the line? Yeah, can you hear me, Connor? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Hi, how are you today? We are well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, thank you. I have a, my my question. I'm going to give a brief comment first, um, and then uh, pose my question if that's okay. Um, of course. I was uh, I, I, like you, Chrissy. I love the police. I uh, my neighbor was a policeman. Uh, I always took a, um, my, my grandfathers were our, were our veterans and so was my dad. And I, I really, you know, I, I used to take neighborhood walks. Um, unfortunately though, um, in like 2005, 2006, I experienced a, a very terrible, uh, situation. And then also in just recently, um, 2017 to 2016, where then I was actually um, wrongfully imprisoned. Um, and the, and back when, in 2006, I was kind of, um, my case kind of got dismissed, but I was seeking compensation and never got it. And then recently now, I was able to have a certificate of remittal and remand. And through that, though, um, there were some officers, again, um, love them to death, it's just that I was, my, my constitutional rights were violated. My first, fourth, fifth, and eighth. And, and I'm, I'm very concerned about that uh, because uh, I suffered a lot of loss. And my question now would be, available for an individual like myself, that compensation could be due retroactively and presently they threw like a certificate of remittal and remand that could offer compensation from officers through that process. Thanks, Peter. I think I, I think I understand that. And I, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your experience and um, I very much appreciate you being on the line and, and sharing that with us. And I think where your question is heading is, um, about largely a qualified immunity conversation, which is basically the idea that right now we have a doctrine in our law that basically makes it impossible or next to impossible for the victim of police violence or uh, police interference in one form or another to have their day in court. And so I think what you're talking about and what you're asking after is getting to this idea of qualified immunity and whether or not um, we can get rid of that so that plaintiffs such as you would be able to have your day in court and, and have a civil suit, be able to bring a civil suit. So what the issue right now, and the chairwoman alluded to this or, or talked about it a little bit, is that the threshold to even begin such a conversation or a lawsuit uh, to potentially collect compensation, as you are asking about, is very, very, very high. The bar is very high. And so this was and is something that is part of the Justice and Policing Act. 
in, on, in all honesty, it's one of the more controversial parts of the Justice and Policing Act. Um, so I'd really love to hear again from the chairwoman about what, why addressing qualified immunity is so important, um, and how you know, what, how she can fill us in on that in, on that important uh, topic. Absolutely, and uh, the representative is is 100% correct when she says that um, it is the most controversial part of the of the uh, bill. Uh, so basically, you know, holding that there's two parts in terms of accountability. One that I mentioned in terms of lowering the standard to prosecute an officer away from trying to figure out what's in their mind to determine whether or not they were reckless. That's one piece. The second piece is for the victim to be able to receive damages. And um, as of right now, you know, qualified immunity means that basically you can't sue the officer. So one of the reasons why it's controversial is because in with smaller cities, smaller cities being sued uh, could be very damaging. And so we have to figure out how to address that. Maybe there's a way for the federal government to help insure smaller cities, something like that. You know, you can sue the individual officer, but, you know, the idea of actually getting something from the individual officer is not going to, um, you know, produce much. In my city, for example, in Los Angeles, uh, we can sue officers here in Los Angeles. Uh, but... 100% of the time when the officer is sued, the city picks up the tab. Well, we're a large city, so we can afford that, but maybe smaller cities. So that's what we have to work out. But as long as an officer feels that they can act with impunity, they're not going to be charged criminally, and they're not going to be sued, we're going to continue to repeat this over and over again. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, uh, go ahead, Connor. I was say thank you. I'm sorry. I wanted to thank Peter for his question, and we've got another one on the line. Um, our next question comes from Genesis in Coatesville. Genesis, you should be on the line. Hi. Yes. Um, my question was about um, how, like, please say they're, they're not um, addiction specialists or mental health professionals, and I wanted to know if there was any legislation in the works regarding having trained mental health professionals or trained addiction counselors um, coming onto the scene with police for those cases. Hi, hi, Genesis, and thanks for your question. Um, before before um, all of this went uh, happened, I was working very hard to focus on mental health and mental health care uh, writ large. Uh, and as you heard in my conversation and experience uh, in the classroom, mental health is a huge issue in communities of color. Um, and I think that uh, focusing on that uh, is really, really important as it is important to focus on the veteran uh, population, as it is important to focus on children and their mental health. You know, um, I know that something like 40% of all kids who go to college is access their campuses mental health facilities at one point or another. The point is mental health care is very, very important. The point is helping in, in the form of um, legislation or congressional uh, thought in this area is very important. We here in this office focus on mental health as an issue for a, a full month. We try to make sure that we uh, take each month to focus on a particular issue and one of our very early months was on this. Uh, back in February was when we were doing a lot of, of those conversations. And as uh, the chairwoman mentioned, police officers are really asked to do an enormous amount of work in the mental health space, uh, domestic violence as well. So I'm, I'm not sure, and maybe the chairwoman can tell us if there's anything federally that we're able to do, if this is a federally, um, uh, if there's a capability at the federal level to be able to talk about this. But I do know that having um, more people on the scene who have backgrounds might be a good idea. Uh, and maybe the chairwoman has some ideas about pending legislation other than what, uh, other than the legislation that I've been supportive of. Right, uh, no, uh, but let me just say that one of the great things about doing federal legislation, it often serves as a catalyst for local legislation. And so although uh, beyond what the representative said, I'm not aware of anything else, but what I am aware of is movement around the country toward that end, where people are looking at their police budgets and saying, well, maybe 
we should use some of the money toward mental health. Maybe we should use some of the money toward substance abuse. Now, I am hoping that the federal government jumps in there too so that the cities don't have to make that choice. But, um, but for right now, us being a catalyst toward local change, I think is very positive. Yeah, and I want to re reiterate that as a freshman member in Congress, I've been really um, intrigued and I've been learning a great deal about the, the kind of superpowers of being a member of Congress. And sometimes the superpower isn't necessarily passing a law. Sometimes it is convening a group of people. Sometimes it is writing a letter that uh, energizes and activates people who maybe haven't been paying attention to something that they ought to have been paying attention to. And sometimes it is, as the chairwoman mentioned, something that allows uh, a good idea to be able to happen at a smaller level or a local or state level. And frankly, the opposite is true as well. Sometimes we get some great, great ideas from our communities um, and from our state legislatures that we're able to implement at the, at the national level as well. Uh, so it is kind of an interesting um, ecosystem or feedback loop. Um, I think, Connor, we have another question. Uh, who is yep, next? Thank, thank you, Genesis, for your question. Um, it looks like our next question. Oh, it looks like our next question actually just hopped off the line. Give us one second. Um, mm -hmm. So our, our next question is going to come from John in Reading. John, you should be on the line. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to address this question to uh, Congresswoman Bass. I've heard you talking about in your kind of opening uh, remarks about uh, the schools and uh, the the issues with, uh, uh, I assume you were talking about uh, uh, black students, the high dropout rate. Uh, what, what do you, uh, uh, I, I would think that uh, that would have to come from the home because, uh, you know, I heard you make a remark that, uh, uh, you told your daughter if you got stopped, if she got stopped by the police to try to survive. Don't you think that was kind of a negative thing to say to to your child? Uh, number one and number two is, you know, if if parents would uh, teach their children to be respectful. I I graduated from Reading High and we we didn't have policemen in the hallways like they have today because. We were taught in the home to respect our our uh, our teachers and uh, uh, people in authority, which today it, I feel that uh, that has just gone right out the, the window. Um, thank you for the question. So let me just say um, a few things about that. I don't believe that the main problem with policing and African Americans is the lack of respect that African Americans have for police. I, I, I don't believe that that's the case. I do understand that oftentimes that's the way the issue is framed, and I think that's because of a basic lack of understanding about our two communities. Uh, when I said I had to talk with my daughter, it was critical that I had that talk because I understand that if she got upset or something happened, that if she didn't, if she didn't respond in a particular way, she could end up harmed. Whereas you have, especially if you're talking about younger people, you can have interactions that are very negative, but they don't result in violence. Uh, and let me give you an example. Dylan Roof went into Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina and murdered nine people. And when the police stopped him, and there's videotape of this, the police walk up to his car. It's a friendly, cordial stop. And on the way home, they got him lunch. I'm, I'm sorry, on the way back to the station, uh, they made sure he had food. Those type of interactions with African Americans are, you know, I wouldn't say non-existent, but extremely rare. If an African American had just killed nine people of any race, if you think the police would have pulled up to his car and responded that way, I don't think that's the case. Nor do I believe that the reason why there's police officers on school campuses is because black people don't know how to show respect. I think it's because we have shifted our priorities. And instead of investing in counseling and tutorials and other supportive services that you find in affluent schools, 
we have chosen to address problems through law enforcement when it comes to minority communities and communities of uh, and uh, poor communities. So that's one of the things that I feel real good about. And I mentioned a few minutes ago, I feel finally relieved that in this time period, I guess because the killing of George Floyd was so egregious, that people are open to hearing something different. Typically what has happened in the past is that has been the response. What did the person do to deserve to be stopped? What did the person do to deserve to be arrested? What did the person do to deserve to be killed? Finally, people are saying, maybe there's something I don't understand about their communities. Maybe there's something I don't understand about their schools. If you look at black schools, you will see our schools where they're black students. They can be completely white schools. You will see an extreme expulsion and suspension rate. And if you look at arrest rates, you will find black folks getting arrested and incarcerated for disproportionate, I mean, disproportionately to the crimes that have been committed. Black folks use drugs no more, no more than white people, but yet black folks are the ones that are arrested two, three, and four times more. So this is an opportunity to say, maybe there's something I don't understand. Maybe there's something I can learn. And I really appreciate your answer, um, uh, Chairwoman Bass. And uh, and I also want to sort of chime in here because this kind of gets to the root of a pretty, you know, important uh, debate that we're all having. You know, kind of on along these lines of where should our resources be spended, spent? Where should we be putting taxpayer dollars? Should we be appropriating resources for uh, police, as an example, or for other resources? And I think that this is. Um, I think all budgets, uh, whether they're federal, whether they're state, whether they're local, whether they're uh, a corporate budget or a nonprofit budget, are a reflection of that community or that organization's values. Uh, and I think your question was a good one, sir, where you, you began with talking about something that's so important, which is equity in education. You know, the fact that we really want to make sure that all of our kids get a good and high and strong education so every last one of them can be amazing. Uh, uh, citizens of our nation. And the reality is, is that a lot of uh, our schools are not equal. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to um, be at, at the Reading School, Reading High School, and seen that, that those, those kids could definitely use some of the resources that the kids here in the community that I sit in are, are able to have. And so budgets and how we allocate them, whether we're putting money towards, as, as we've had conversations from Genesis about mental health, whether we're putting resources towards um, any other education itself, um, environmental equity is another thing. Those are all choices that we need to make. And, and, and I'll leave it with this as well. You know, I serve on the Armed Services Committee, and I really very much believe in a strong uh, national defense. But that whole budget, that whole pie is something that we should be talking about uh, and not necessarily trying to take from one part of a pie and give it to another part of the pie without the larger conversation that needs to, needs to happen. Um, Thank you so much for your question. Uh, I think we might be able to take one more question with our time. Actually, uh, Christy, we are just out of time. I wanted to make sure I oh. got you and Congresswoman Bath time for closing remarks. But I did want to say we've had, it looks like, over 2,000 people attend today on the phone. So I understand there are still a number of questions in the queue. Again, our office will get back to you within 48 hours with a res uh, response to your question. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Congresswoman Bass, for any closing remarks. Well, let me just thank you and thank the constituents of the 6th District. I really appreciated the opportunity to engage with you. I hope this is not the last time. And once again, you should feel very proud you have a representative like Representative Houlihan. She is uh, really uh, representing you well in Congress, and I look forward to continue to work with her. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman, uh, and I want to thank everyone as well for joining us today uh, for this very critical conversation. Um, I want very much to thank the Chairwoman for taking her time. As she mentioned, we are a body of 435 members, uh, and she has been so gracious to share her time for this conversation. Uh, this is a first in a series of town halls that we are organizing to focus on anti-racism at the legislative le level, so please do stay tuned for updates on our next uh, in that series. 
the road, uh, as we know, to full equality is very long. Uh, we really genuinely must continue to work hard. But the necessary work of dismantling systemic racism in our country uh, is something that is critical to do. And that starts with these crucial and sometimes difficult conversations. And it starts with subsequent and very deliberative action on all of our part. We all have the chance right now to be leaders uh, and to do the right thing. And as um, Kyle Boyer said so eloquently, to do something. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to serve you all. I'm looking forward to the subsequent conversations we have on this subject and on many others. Uh, as I mentioned, we have had 24 town halls and um, I'm really looking forward to the next opportunity to connect with you all. Talk to you soon and thank you.